Yes. Frank and Lisa have a lovely family. Um, and I just want to say that I love you guys so much. Every year we get the best ones. <laughs> Rock and roll always to the tip. <laughs> we were over at Frank's the other day and it was the window. Sun had come down. It was like a young musical genius had just walked <laughs> in the room wanting to play everything and steal the show away. That's right. He wrote a song when he was like nine years old. Wow. He actually came up with the Monty Python theme for a song which lived to the next day. It's a true song. Oh, that is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, we'll have to come back to Frank's Hall when we go to Frank's Hall. So what are you guys up to for Christmas or New Year's or visiting? Or well, my daughters are coming into town and so we ended up um, having a New Year's um, celebration with them and we're going to play a gig together. Oh, wow. So it's Jamie Hampton and Olga Bedeska and Felicia Brown and Abby and we're, we're going to put a band together. Where are you playing? In uh, At the Cannery in Maple Beach. Right, the Cannery. On New Year's Day. On, On New, New Year's, Year's Day? Day. Oh, yeah. that's awesome. What time does it start? Oh, it's probably about 9 o'clock. About 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm. So everybody out there listening, make sure you get yourself down to the Cannery in Newport Beach on New Year's Eve to see Frank, Jamie Hunting, and Frank's daughters, Jessica and Lisa. And Lisa and Tony will play with Sabrina Sanchez. Oh, you guys going to do a little guest a guest appearance on that? Uh, Turner will just be on that <laughs> stage away. <laughs> say a big thank you. We had a great week last week, didn't we? We had a fantastic week last week. We had Jay Hunter in the studio. He had his little hour live concert that he had, which was beautiful. He did, and we had the Pie Throwdown. Pie Throwdown. We had two pies come in. Jay baked the pies. He was just genius, man. <laughs> he can bake a good pie. A and very good pie. And we had another musical guy come in. He was the judge. His name was Bradley Cole. And he didn't know he was going to be a judge before he arrived. Thankfully, he ate pie, so it's yeah. all right. All he did for the show until the very <laughs> end was eat pie. <laughs> all we, all we kept, everyone was speaking, and all he kept hearing was, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> <laughs> it was really nice. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Are, th are those two sisters? Yeah, they're two sisters. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Drive Mary crazy. Mary from yeah. Nowhere with us. And he used to drink coffee and smoke cigarettes in the States and, and drive her crazy. And she didn't particularly like him. But anyway, there's a story about him setting up his Marshall Anthony Jaguar for at the dam at the end of Woodland, which is a couple blocks away from the New York Metro. And he set up playing in front of 400 people. And the sheriffs were trying to drive the people away, but they would refuse to go. So they just let him play. And him, I mean, j let him play. Wow. And it was an impromptu concert in Sierra Madre. That's awesome. So <laughs> still on the subject of Hendrix, every uh, people that wasn't listening last week, uh, Heartbeat of a Planet is giving away a Christmas present. So if you contact us on our website, which is www.heartbeatofaplanet.com, then and type your name in, contact us. We'll put you in for the draw, which is a raffle on Christmas Day, and whichever name we pick out, as long as you're in the L.A. area, you will get Jade Hendrix come to your house to give you and your friends a private concert in your living room with Erin and I there to record a radio show which will be played live on the radio the following week. And you'll be our extra special guest. If not, you can always call into the radio at 213-973-2977. So that is for your Christmas present of Jade Hendrix giving you a private concert in your living room and us guys recording a radio show. Sounds like a nice Christmas present. Sounds like a very nice Christmas present. I hope Sweet. Jade's still okay with that. <laughs> 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 so um, anyway, we're going to play a song right now by Bradley Coney. He was on the show last week. Um, thought I'd refresh everyone's memories out there. This is a song called Mother. And we're going to play it because it's Brad's birthday tomorrow. So we're playing this for him. Happy birthday, Brad. Happy birthday, Brad. And here you go. This is Mother. Hope you enjoy.
have you gone? The TV's playing, but nothing's on. We've lost our way, we've idolized celebrities and merchandise. Mother, what's going on? Why are we listening to nature's song? Disaster strikes, still we don't see. We're so in need of harmony. It's been way too long. It's been way too long. Most of us are struggling just to survive It's been way too long It's been way too long I don't want to wait to live my life Mother, how cheap is life? No one great war, it happened twice And now we're close to number three I wonder when we'll let it be <laughs> It's been way too long Most of us are struggling just to survive It's been way too long It's been way too long And I don't want to wait to live my life It's been way too long It's been way too long Most of us are struggling just to survive it's been way too long It's been way too long I don't want to wait to live my life I know We can't go back again I know We're in the lion's den I hope The end is heaven sent I hope What have we done? And we're back. That was Mother by Bradley Cohn. Everybody get out there, check it out on YouTube. Bradley Cohn. How do you spell Cohn, honey? K O H N. And it's the second version. The most recent version is the one he wants people to watch. And the reason that is, is in the first version, he had a lyric that he got told by a lot of people that he should change because it might offend a lot of people. Well, it was kind of funny because the reason people might find it offensive, it's not actually an offensive word, um, but he was told that his music is quote-unquote love-making music and that it's something people don't want to be reminded of in that mood. So he had to change the word uh, for that reason. So check out the second version of Mother by Bradley Cohn. And right now we're back in the studio with... We're here with Frank Symes and Lisa Verlo. So... Tell me, guys, I hear that you guys wrote a musical together. That's correct. What's it about? What's it called? You want to... It's called The Door. It's called The Door. And yeah. it's about the door itself is a, the metaphorical door that gets us from point A to point B. Uh, it's a, s a story about um, a person who um, wants to create a new life for herself and um, she has had a modicum of success but she wants to try to make a break at late in life well it's about the entertainment industry in yeah. los angeles right? oh right. okay so it's a satire about the entertainment industry as well as a love story and it's also um what is it what else is it about oh it's a kind of a coming of age story as well 
Wow, that sounds yeah, like so you got all interweaved and uh, coming woven. Of middle age, which is another coming of age that we don't always get to. That sounds amazing. That sounds like it's something that nearly everyone in Los Angeles would be able to relate to. <laughs> That's <Thank> correct. So. <laughs> yeah, the most craziest place in the world. Everybody out here is searching for a dream. It's That's uh, right. Wanting in, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. mean, coming from England as well, like, yeah, I mean, even in England, everyone has it. You go to Hollywood to make yourself. And you actually come here and the amount of people that have came here to do that and it's not work for them. Mm -hmm. it, it's like one side is really happy and then there's another side that is really sad. It, absolutely. Mm -hmm. There's a whole shadow side. I think, you know, the people come here with illusions and delusions of grandeur and they try to make their dreams come true and 99.5% of them don't make it, you know, so. Even higher than that. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, yes. We're still trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're doing all right. <laughs> but it's got a sense of humor, too. So it's kind of, oh, an, yeah, an, upbeat, of <clears throat> an upbeat musical about things that might not be quite so bright in reality. That's correct. That's nice. yeah. So was this the first musical you guys have ever wrote? Uh, yeah, actually, it's the first one we wrote. We have about um, five on the back burner and two oh. that we're um, working on right now because we pretty much found our calling writing musicals. It's fantastic. Seems to come to us. Fantastic fun. Easily. And yeah. so uh, we've turned a lot of heads. We have a, a person sort of representing us now and a prominent uh, lawyer who does work on Broadway and... Um, as actually, the firm uh, handles all the Broadway plays. So. Wow! So we, they, uh, you sent us uh, the trailer over. Yeah. And uh, we both watched it and got to tell everyone out there it looked fantastic. It looks really good. Um, and where can our audience view that? I think it's on the. Well, you know, is uh, it on YouTube? The, the door a musical dot com. We've still got the website up. Yeah. It was sort of held back a little because we had sort of a, we didn't have a whole run of it, but we did we four walled a production which was fully staged, fully costume choreographed, amazing, at the um, Sierra Madre Playhouse last year, but it was mainly for investors and sort of to get it going. Um, so we haven't gotten a full full run out there yet, but, but I'm uh, sure you will. I'm sure. It'll, yes. I'm sure it's coming. Well, the idea, and then we're thinking, well, let's just kind of do something online and do some music videos with some of the songs and there's some fun pieces. Well, I, for one, cannot wait to see its full production. Um, so for audience out there, you can view it at The Door. The, is it, what the is it? Thedooramusical.com. That's right. Thedooramusical.com by Frank Symes and Lisa Verlo. And we're on Facebook, too. So. Oh, okay. And where on Facebook can they find you? Um, Facebook, The Door, A Musical. Oh, I perfect. Think. <laughs> so what was it like putting the, sh like the show together that you did just for that one trailer? I mean, that's mm. got to be an experience out of this world. It was crazy. It was great, though, because it was one of those amazing examples of synergy where you just run into one person who leads you to the next, who leads you to the next. So we, all of a sudden we just like accumulated this team pretty much of, of found a, a sort of an associate producer and then we have a musical director who came in because Frank was actually musical director for The Who at the time working on Quadrophenia. So he was like, you know, I'll do whatever you want with the music, but, you know, you take care of the production. <laughs> so I was directing it and found an amazing choreographer through the other channels and Ricky Lugo, who's just fantastic, and, and Susan Lukather, who came in as our musical director to help Frank out because he was so busy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so it just kind of came together. And uh, while I was preparing Quadrophenia for the Who tour, um, <clears throat> um, uh, I had to, I, I saw the rehearsal and I realized we needed a, a finale. Right. And so I, I wanted to create a reprise <clears throat> of the... Um, the theme song which is called the door and i i did that in the midst of all the madness that i was going through working 14 hours a day for three and a half months doing about a year's work in less than four months wow. but the theme song the door i should bring this up is it's kind of when we first started collaborating we that's one of the first songs we worked on together not thinking it was going to evolve into a musical but um i had some lyrics and kind of started just started working together and um 
Frank fully produced this piece, and we sat back and went, wow, that's pretty powerful. And it evolved into a musical, into a the musical. one song. Wow. Yeah. So we is... wrote about 20 songs, but uh, that was the beginning. That is incredible. Mm -hmm. And uh, for our listeners out there, we're going to play that right now, aren't we? Right. We're going to play the finale that I wrote in yeah. one day and put together, and, and then we used it. Uh, at the performance. <laughs> That's absolutely <laughs> wild. So we hope everyone out there enjoys it and completely appreciates it. So here you go. This is The Door Grand Finale by Frank Sines and Lisa Verla. The Door by Frank Symes and Lisa Verlo from their musical, The Door. Um, so we're back in the studio with Frank and Lisa today. Um, and we were talking about how you came up with, with the musical, The Door. Um, and what's your writing process? Like, I can only imagine you guys in your kitchen kind of throwing around ideas while you're making dinner. Is exactly. That... <laughs> right. As a matter of fact, uh, some of the instruments came out of the kitchen. No. <laughs> on other songs we've done. Other songs. But, oh, we're um, going to play one of those for you a little bit later right. on. That's right. And I believe you're playing Pots and Pans in it. Is that correct? And, uh, suitcase, other, an old suitcase, an old leather suitcase. An old, my, old, uh, my father's old steamer, which is a leather, a way right. to call a leather suitcase that weighs a ton. And that was the <laughs> kick drum sound. I, uh, actually, a burning match was used as a percussion instrument. Wow. And um, other things out of the toolbox and the kitchen drawers. <laughs> the kids out there at home. Don't try that at home with a Never. burning match <laughs> as an instrument and not the pots and pans or the suitcase. Yeah. Your parents might not be happy oh, about I it. I don't know. That's what we used to do on New Year's Eve. Um, so my mom didn't necessarily <laughs> stay up all the time. But as soon as it was midnight, we'd, we'd all go out with my dad with pots and pans and wooden spoons and bang yeah. on them and yell, Happy Happy New Year into How the neighborhood. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It was. It was. Yeah. We had fireworks. I'm going to have to give my dad a call and be like, Where was my yeah. pots and pans? <laughs> I think we woke up the entire neighborhood every time we did it because no one's lights were on and we'd just go out there and start shouting and banging on pots uh, and pans. Yeah, wake them up. Good time to wake up the neighbors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So back to writing The Door. Right. Um, what is the experience like? How long does how long did it take you? Um, all of it. Well, initially, we burned through, we, we probably wrote about 12 songs in a month, maybe 15. We um, pretty much wrote wow. the whole thing in three yeah, months. Pretty much wrote it, and then we uh, supplemented it with uh, songs that we came up with later. But then we had a, a long uh, break. We took a long Having sabbatical, a so to speak, because we had a baby. <laughs> and then that, so in order to finish it up, uh, we waited a few years to do that. But um, the process comes, at, uh, comes in many ways. Um, you know, first you have to be enthusiastic about something, and uh, you know that's really the source. And yeah. you, and if you go, well, why don't, why don't we write a song about this? You know, and then uh, we talk about it, try to sort of create an image, and do a lot of brainstorming, and then that turns into uh, that sort of um, transmogrifies or, uh, into a, a melody or a musical idea, and then. The lyrics sort of happen at the same time. Usually, it happens simultaneously. Right. When it's so. really exciting, it pretty much does. I mean, mm -hmm. and other times, you'll just all of a sudden just be inspired. I remember when you came up with uh, the circus song, it just you just lit up one night and was standing in, in the kitchen or right outside the kitchen, and just started rolling off these ideas in his head and just kind of getting into it, and and pretty much came up with the whole song right then and there. Wow, that, right. I remember that well. 
Yeah, it was a kind of a comedic version of uh, Nathaniel West's um, Day of the Locust. Um, that's a lot more serious, but that was kind of the image. <laughs> Add to that some sort of clowning, right? And then uh, in a in a message or a statement about, you know, the shadow side of entertainment, or yeah. in the industry. Um, um, and then that's how it came about. It's just um, we thought. I thought Nathaniel West. I thought uh, make it sound like a circus, three ring circus. You know, Hollywood uh, as a circus. Yep. Yeah. Definitely so, is. Yes, <laughs> of sorts. Yes. Yeah. Very crazy yeah. circus. But we're all scared of clowns, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> exactly. so there's that side of it too. So we went to town on that one. Yeah, that was great. But some things, it's also just um, get inspired musically, and he comes up with some a musical theme, and I'll just you know just hear lyrics to it other times i mean it's pretty amazing uh, um when we interviewed you you spoke about how the magic that happens when when the music and the lyrics just kind of merge together and come together perfectly yeah it's prosody yeah that's that's pretty much the most exciting part of songwriting i think is is when it hits you and you start getting the chills it really there's a chill factor there's always a chill factor it's like ooh, it gives me goosebumps right Wouldn't you say that yeah i would say so and then you, you use you combine initial creative spark with some writing skills, actual skills that I've learned from listening to all the greats. You know, it could be George Gershwin, it could be Randy Newman, it could be Beethoven, it could be anybody. Uh, you know, but there's a certain way to write that I like. I'm not going to give it away on the on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something that all the great writers do in melody writing. And plus, you use uh, the best possible prosody, which is to emphasize the right syllables in a given uh, metric uh, scheme. Yeah. And um, that's why, well, good poetry is good poetry, because it has good prosody. And uh, the same applies to lyric writing. And if you don't have good prosody, you don't have good song. Right. And you know. What's amazing to me is that actually Frank had very little background in musical theater. You never really even went to musicals, did you? He's well, a rock and roll guy way back. I mean, he you know, just totally... When I was a kid, I... I went to all of them. I mean, and I knew right. Jesus Christ Superstar backwards and forwards. We'd sing it in the back of a station wagon in the days when you can actually bop around the back of a station wagon without your seatbelt on. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be, like, singing it. So I knew all the musicals. And, well, you, of course, knew all the greats. Which I was, played like, in Godspell. Did oh, you? Right. Okay. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I had to read notes and everything. I was oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so now you tell me. So you did have a... <laughs> Uh, but Lisa, you came from a, a theater and musical background, didn't you? Yeah, my whole interest in early on was well, was acting, and then, but I always loved musicals, and then got into song and songs and film and all that. Yeah. So this this has kind of brought you full circle back to your it has your original path. It has, and that's what's so um, exciting too is just finding that all these roads we took now kind of all lead to one. And, you know, it all comes together. So that's kind of fun. And what's really fun now is being the writer. I can actually write it in the keys that I want to sing. Because actually, I didn't get a lot of parts in high school because the songs were out of my range. I was kind of a mezzo-soprano, and they were all for sopranos. Or, and uh, so now I just, and of course, now we have people complaining, well, it's a little too low. <laughs> 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 you know, we can change them. I like that. So for all of you out there who can't sing, such as myself, just rewrite songs, write them in however sounds good for your voice, and you'll be able to sing them. That's right. You can even, I'll even write you a song and you can just talk it. Aww. <laughs> Aww. A little music, Thanks, honey. To your own, you know. <laughs> exactly. And, um, That's called spoken word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> spoken word. You could do anything you want. I recommend it, and, you know, just tailor it to yourself. Well, Aaron and I recently, um, I've been playing, uh, playing my guitar and writing songs in the morning, and... Uh, Erin is an amazing tap dancer. Wow. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I love to tap. I don't uh, know if I'm amazing, but I do love it. And now nice. she got her tap dancing shoes out of the <laughs> attic, <laughs> brought them down, and now every morning we have coffee. I play a little bit of reggae. And I tap the drums. That's I great. love it. It's a, per, it's a percussion instrument. It's, yeah. yeah. Frank's a, daughter um, taps and yeah. plays oh. the drums. Which really? do, which do your daughter? Audrey. Audrey. I always out-tapped her teachers, and she's... A, an expert in tapping now. So, yeah, you and Audrey awesome. will have to get together and do yeah. a tap. A little bit of a tap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I'm, she's probably a lot better than I am, but I'll try and follow along. Mm -hmm. That would be fun. <laughs> well, what are you doing for New Year's Eve? Come, come down and tap. 
Oh, we're yeah. thinking about. Yeah. We, we today we were driving down here talking. What are we going to do for New Year's Eve? And banging pots and pans around. Tapping. Doesn't sound well, that no, much fun anymore. You know what? So. The, the problem is that my dad doesn't stay awake anymore. Mm. So it's so funny because my parents are total night owls and they're mm. awake till two in the morning most days. But for somehow on New Year's Eve, they're in bed by eleven. <laughs> See, and then cut out, come down to Newport Beach, bring your top shoes, some pots and pans, party. That might be a great New Year's Eve. We'd love to. I, I, you know what I think I might do? So I have a pair of um, Dorothy, like from the Wizard of Oz, glittery red ta- Ooh, shoes. Yeah. So I might take my taps off my normal tap shoes and put them on those and yeah. I'll bring those. That Woo-hoo. sounds fantastic. <laughs> There's a new band that's going around at the moment that's getting some um, notice quite well. What is it? He's... It's called He's My Brother, She's My Sister. And their drummer is a tap dancer and she, she stands on a kick drum. And she taps, taps on the drum. On the drum. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Love so, um, yeah, we've found out about that. Have you ever heard the band uh, Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros? I have heard. The, um, the percussionist out of that, it's his girlfriend's band. And, yeah, it's, apparently it's meant to be a fantastic stage show mm. to go down and watch. So, yeah, watch out for them. Uh, so back to the musical. You said yep. it sparked something in you guys and you just write in a bunch of musicals. Right. Well, yeah. <laughs> We're working on two right now. But, uh, you know, the whole process is exciting because so it involves ev- just about every sense and every yeah. m- media that the arts give us. You yeah. know, um, d- dancing, choreography, stage design, just the whole look of it, you know, just the, even the print work that is involved. Mm-hmm. Or And not to mention the music, the lyrics, the melodies. Um, you can have it orchestrated. You don't have to. You can have just a band. You can You can do it in so many ways and um, it just keeps it exciting because the possibilities are really endless they are yeah that's awesome mm-hmm. I think in every should... direction so that's the great part of it you know, so um, visually and musically do you have the two that you're working on right now can you talk about either of them or are they top secret right now well one of them is kind of top secret okay um, you know the subject matter is yeah rather risky all right, as well. all right. Yeah. their lips are but, sealed on that one but one of them is called instant life and what it is is um Actually, it's a musical within the musicals. It's mentioned in the door oh. as one of the characters in the door is working on this musical. And all along, we thought, oh, well, we're going to write that musical too because that's hey, really it's cool. Kind of dream yeah. within a dream yeah. sort of thing, you know. What's interesting is that just recently we started to wonder whether maybe it would even make a good animation musical. Oh. So that's kind of what we're, we're looking at now, but we're still working on all the songs and. Um, and um, that's pretty exciting. And the other one is very exciting, but we'll tell you about it when we're, when we're ready to reveal okay. it. Because, all right. Well, when you're yeah. ready to reveal it, mm-hmm. we'd love to get you back in right. and <laughs> chat all about it. Sounds good. Today it's The Door, right. then we'll be on to the next one the next time. Um, and okay. was there another song from The Door that you wanted us to play? Mm. Well, Once You're There was a song. It's one of the later ones that we wrote. That's and correct. I'd have to say, um, yeah, that's it's pretty moving for both of us. Um, sometimes you write a song and later you sit back and go, wow, we wrote that? <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> yeah, cool. It seemed to write itself. You know? really? yeah. It was like uh, in, a, in a hunk of air, there's a song, right. and you just have to carve, carve uh, away it. what's not the song, <laughs> yeah. like uh, you know, Rodin doing a sculpture. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And uh, the, it was just there already, it mm-hmm. seemed. You know? So it, it did surprise me later that, wow, we wrote that. <laughs> It's incredible. Well, we'll play it right we, now. We had a friend Not of, to tout um, it so much, you know, but it's just an <laughs> honest reaction. I'm just saying. And we sent it off to... I um, said it. <laughs> we mentioned the singer, too, because we sent it off. It wasn't one of the singers from the production, but a uh, friend of Frank's who really brought it to life, too. Oh, to yeah. Hear. The singer, uh, Shem, Shem Van Schrock, is a, a son of a very famous composer. You would right. recognize many of his melodies from TV shows. And uh, other shows, um, but um, he's amazing. Yeah, yeah. He did a great uh, job. And Shem is an opera singer. He tours Europe, and, and he play. I play with him in uh, Don Felder's band. He's a bass player, but he plays many instruments, and his singing is outstanding. Very Fantastic. nice. Well, everybody out there, here is "Once You're There" from the musical "The Door." Enjoy. <laughs> Once you're there It's never quite what you imagine Once you're there 
Another question will be nagging once you're there There's always more Another wall, another door Always one more level Somewhere else to go You may think that you arrived Once you're there you realize It's not real about getting there it's not about going far it's more about being in touch with who you are it's not about proving anything to someone else it's really how you feel about your you're there you think your life will change somehow once you're there you realize you're still the same now that you're there look around at what you've got what have you found it's not about the games you've won it's not just who you know Trials of life that you've been through But how you perceive yourself to be How do you really feel? Are you happy? It's not about getting there It's not about going far But how you choose to be in touch with who you are It's not about Compromises that were made That voice of recognition That feeling deep inside An honest admission Beyond faith or pride That inner voice, that knowing That state of being aware Of who you really are Once you're there Once You're There from the musical The Door, written by Frank Symes and Lisa Verlo. And we're in the studio today with Frank and Lisa. Um, so, Frank, we, um, Phil and I first met you in England. Yes. Um, and we, we'd contacted you for an interview. Um, and you had just directed the music, or been the music director for the Quadrophenia tour for The Correct. Who. Um, well, when we had our interview with you, you told us your whole life story. And Did I? Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. And that was in the first. <laughs> well, you interview. gave us some highlights. You gave us some highlights of your life story, and I've got to say, it's an incredible life, an incredible journey, mm. and an incredible career. So, um, so, so, can you tell us um, a little bit about how you started with music? Well, um, I got a guitar for Christmas when I was ten or eleven, and um, my sister. Uh, there was a lot of music in the family. My mother listened to the Platters, Ray Charles, Drifters, and uh, my sister listened to Elvis and Coltrane, Miles Davis, and her boyfriend listened to surf music. So I got a little bit of everything. And then the Beatles came around, and so my next door neighbor played guitar, and we got together, formed a band. The, our porch that we shared was a large duplex on an army base in Japan. 
and my next door neighbor Paul Metzger. I wonder if he's still around. Right. But uh, anyway, he and I put a band together. And we played a bunch of Beatles songs uh, on on our porch, and that was my first stage. And then in the sixth grade, that wasn't too long after that. A couple years later, um, I had a three piece band and. Uh, I played in a, in a talent show. Uh, I played Hendrix in a talent show <laughs> right. with a three-piece band, and um, won some kind of award, you know. So, ba- so back to the first band on the porch. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite Beatles song to play? Oh, I think it was "I Want to Hold Your Hand." Oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah, I want to hold your hand. He's a sweet guy, our friend. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, yeah, I had. Uh, Lennon and McCartney influences early on, and um, just picked up the guitar really on my own. I didn't really take any lessons. The the only formal training I had was uh, in school. Uh, from I'd been singing in choir since the second grade, so I could read notes all right, at least one note at a time. And uh, <laughs> and um, so I had a little bit of. So I've grown up uh, learning how to knowing how to read some music and sort of playing, learning how to play the guitar on my own without instruction. And uh, it wasn't until much later that I took lessons from people, people like, well, Robert Fripp or uh, of Ken Crimson and uh, Frank Gambale, uh, an incredible guitar player that played with uh, Chick Corea. And, right. uh, but I, I've only taken a, probably a total of, oh, oh and uh, Ted Green was another one of my mentors, and I only took five lessons from him. I think I've taken a week's worth of lessons <laughs> in my life. Otherwise, I've taken music in high school, har- you know, theory, harmony, uh, and uh, clarinet, flute, um, and some piano in college and high school. But he can play almost every instrument well, there is. That's going <laughs> too far. String. There's pots and pans, pots and, and, pans suitcases. and ratchets. And matches. <laughs> and matches. Oh, the ratchet. That's matches. I'm really good with the matches. I teach advanced match, match. theory. <laughs> no, but really, he picks up a cello and he can just start playing the cello. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah, she she got a cello, you know. And we saw it when we went over great, there. Yeah. yeah. So now we have a double bass in the studio and a cello in the studio. We even have a violin. And a large box of box of matches. And <laughs> lots and lots of matches. <laughs> so what was it like growing up in Japan? And well, for me, it was um, unusual. My father was um, General MacArthur's legal attaché, and oh. he went there right after the war to help set up the new government in Japan to write a new constitution. He had a he co co formed the language of the new Japanese constitution. He is a constitutional expert. And um, he was also an, uh, his his uh, expertise was in international law, and uh, a very smart man as well. And so um, um, he spoke nine languages, Japanese being one of them. He was originally from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. His background is uh, Scot uh, Scottish, English, and French. And uh, he married my mother, who's Japanese from Tokyo. And then uh, I grew up. I was an American citizen by birth, but. I had never seen the state. I hadn't seen the states until I was fifteen. Wow! Oh, yeah, that's... and so I grew up there. Uh, first in the middle of Tokyo, um, a beautiful hilltop area. I, I had no idea how well I had it. Uh, we had an English millionaire living next to us, and the, and two doors over was uh, the owner of the Tokyo power system. All oh, right, okay. <laughs> the Furukawa, uh, uh, the the the, uh, the patriarch Furukawa, who whose family owned. Tokyo, and they still do, I believe. And they, they are one of the largest industries in the world still. So, oh. yeah. so it was so. a nice neighborhood. So it was a very, a very nice We had a beautiful Japanese garden and, you know, goldfish yeah. and koi and, and nice. polished boulders and cherry trees and three architects designed our house. And we had a live-in maid. You know, I had it great. And then, I, <laughs> and then we moved, we, uh, tra- my father planned a trip to Russia. We traveled across Siberia by train, and then we went to Germany, England. This was all my first sights uh, uh, outside Japan. Um, uh, all my, uh, this my first uh, experience of being outside of Japan. Um, and it was really eye-opening and, uh, you know, uh, being on the Russian trains with and drinking vodka with uh, r- Russian soldiers and you know stuff like that. And, uh, <laughs> but, but tell them about before that all happened. You saw wood, Woodstocks. Tell. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, so you yeah. want to hear that part of it? Right, right. Well, uh, well, all of it's good. So but, yeah. when I was thirteen or fourteen, would the film of Woodstock came out, um, and of course uh, the band that steals the show, in my view, is was the Who, and. Um, 
I just saw Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, and I was just knocked out. And and the full sound, they played the orchestrally, and I just there was no band like them. And I said, I saw them. I I went to see. I paid high dollars or yen to go see this at a Japanese theater in Tokyo, and I saw it eight times. Eight wow. times. Eight times. I was thirteen. I saw Woodstock eight times. Wow. The Who blew me away every time. My mouth. I was just my jaw dropped every time. I said, "That's what I want to do," or something right. like that. That's what I want to do. So then, you know, unbelievably, a few decades later, I wind up becoming the musical director for the Who, which is st- I, still still surreal. <laughs> how, how does that work out? I don't know. Uh, well, well, I met Roger first. Right. Yeah. He had been playing in a charity band and wasn't pleased with his guitar player so he fired him and then they got another guy he was more of a blues player and then roger turned to the members of the band and said doesn't anybody know how to play this music and uh rob ladd a good friend of mine who was in the band uh, said i know a guy frank and um and then nigel sinclair who's a, a movie producer uh seconded that motion and said yeah i've followed frank you know for a long time many years and he's the guy who could do it and so i came in and then uh was it wasn't really a formal audition, but go ahead. Wasn't it behind blue eyes? Yes, it was. <laughs> How well you remember. Uh, it, well, it sticks out in my it's memory. It's Phil's favorite Who song. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. It, it is one of the... It's, uh, it's a, definitely a striking uh, song. And uh, so, yeah, he, he... I was in... Uh, there was a uh, rehearsal place um, uh, in West L.A., and Roger came sauntering in, mindlessly playing... Behind Blue Eyes on his acoustic guitar, and uh, I don't know if he knew, knew I was just standing there, but I started playing the song, and he kind of looked at me and nodded and said, oh, you know it. So he went to the microphone and started singing it. I hadn't met him yet, yeah. and I chimed in and played all the parts and sang all the background vocals, and then after, the, we we were surrounded by everyone else in, produ- in the production, and uh, he nodded and gave me his approval and said, well, that'll do. <laughs> And he goes, Roger. <laughs> All right, mate. I'm and, Roger. Uh, and so we shook hands, and then from then on, it was uh, a match made in heaven. That is absolutely... Uh, Such a great story. Yeah. Can happen to anyone. Shows you your dreams can come true. Yeah, the power of a dream. Yeah. So was it before uh, meeting Roger and stuff? Didn't you play with Mick Jagger for a yes, while? Yes, I did. Yeah. What was yeah. that experience? And th- like? This is going to be my one boast. <laughs> okay? And I think I touted myself That's earlier, but this is my boast. <laughs> okay? So I got life. the tout, now I got the boast. Okay? <laughs> so uh, my boast is that uh, Mick Jagger had a, a database of 650 guitar players, and uh, he didn't try them all out, of course. Um, but I think he tried, about, tried out about 40, auditioned about right. 40, and, and he cho- in, he, in New York and in L.A., and uh, he chose me. And... He was such a pleasure to work with. I can't even tell you. That's I'm sorry, that's I realize, a... yeah, that everyone chooses Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I chose him. Exactly. You must see that twinkle in your eye. Yeah, that's, what it, that's what it is. <laughs> I've worked very hard on that twinkle, let me tell you. <laughs> he's perfected it. <laughs> he's perfected it. <laughs> Now he's just stroking his own ego. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, he's got no, a tow. I'm kidding a, completely. A <laughs> I have no idea whether I have a twinkle or not. <laughs> yes, I look twinkle, in the mirror. Honey. You go, got a twinkle. Twinkle, work, work, you twinkle. Because <laughs> our son has that twinkle. I can, I can oh, see. Definitely. <laughs> Gets it from his daddy. Yeah. Um, so uh, you were telling us before that when you worked with Mick Jagger. Yeah. That uh, he was very generous with his time. Like, oh, generous with everything. You know, his smiles. He would light up a room when you walked in. And he was, you know, I can't, I'm not going to name any names, but I got to tell you that, you know, celebrity status is not such an easy burden to carry. I think uh, people don't uh, handle it very well. And But uh, Mick is definitely the exception. Um, he has the spirit of a 18-year-old. And, he, you know, we, we would be in the studio and he, and he would dance to every take. And to see if he, he could groove with it, you know? And how many musicians can you say do that? They take some, themselves all too seriously. He liked to dance. He just likes to dance, you know? Nice. It's like the T-Rex song where he danced right out of the womb. Yeah. He, he danced right out of the womb. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so, go ahead. So, I'm going to take another quick break because life's a rocket. What's all that all right. about, Frank? 
oh, the ups and downs of life, rockets go up, they come down. <laughs> <laughs> so the first verse is about, uh, you know, the, the miseries of love, and the second one is about uh, the enlightenment. And so, uh, and then um, it's just about that. It's, it's based on real experience. And this, this is one is, of your originals, one of his originals. Yeah, one right. of your originals. And this is your band? Yeah, Top Cat. Yeah, Top Cat. I, I, I wrote that one a while back. The, the other one that we may play is Hollywood Friends, and that's more recent. But anyway, it's still under the heading Top Cat. Right, okay. Yeah. And so do you gig with your band? Yeah, we much? play. We just played a gig in uh, Laguna Beach at the Mozambique. Right, and okay. uh, we have a big following there. Um, it's fun music. It's kind of sort of uh, a takeoff, a spinoff on uh, sort of... Uh, British glam uh, rock right. of the early 70s, kind of Mott the Hoople, Bowie, yeah. T-Rex kind of thing. Beautiful. Yeah. So um, is there anywhere online people can find out when your next shows are and things like that? Topcat.com. Right? Topcat. Top I think they have all the dot coms. We can't keep that. track of all these dot coms. <laughs> Topcat does My have a Facebook page too. <laughs> and well, franksimes.com. Is, is, so we can it. find Frank at franksimes.com, and that's spelled F-R-A-N-K-S-I-M-E-S dot com. Um, and then we also have topcat.com, which is T-O-P-C-A-T dot com. Perfect. And here it is, Life's a Rocket by Topcat.
So that was Life's a Rocket, performed by Top Cat and written by Frank Symes, who we're here in the studio with. Uh, we're also here with Lisa Verlo. Um, so before the break, we were talking to Frank about his history as a musician, um, and he was telling us some of his amazing stories. Um, and we left off, we were talking about you working with Mick Jagger, Roger Daltrey. Uh, what have you been doing lately? Well, I'm working on my own band, Top Cat. Um, this is aside from all the collaboration I do with Lisa. Um, I'm... Uh, working on putting an album together to put on iTunes and uh, later we'll hear a song called Hollywood Friends which is uh, one of the uh, flagship songs of the album and um, so there you have it I'm I'm uh, working on a promo video and um, we're going to get some bookings worldwide well because one thing is kind of interesting is um, Frank's been so busy as a performer he's hardly gotten anything online because he just doesn't have time so I'm going you know we got to get it together yeah. and get a presence and he's written hundreds of thousands of songs <laughs> thousands well no but, but a piece <laughs> of music billion <laughs> of songs <laughs> well for, for paramount pictures you did a lot of composing you've written songs for films and um just you know hasn't gotten around to putting them all it's online true. it's too many like where do you start <laughs> you know so. exactly you need to make some more videos so people can see your face because i saw it recently on a McDonald's commercial. Oh, That's no. right. We both saw it. Yeah, it's Frank. True. Frank's doing a little bit of acting these days. I'm loving it. <laughs> no, actually, I said His that, bills, but it wasn't recorded. Yeah. They didn't use any audio. Yeah, that's right. I was in my bathrobe, and she just like uh, <clears throat> took a picture and sent it in, and it got used. Frank so. was rocking out in the video. Oh, yeah, in my bathroom. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny how it's user-generated <laughs> content now. You can just send stuff in, and it's like winning the jackpot. It's That's fun. really cool. We, we'd we seen Frank, and he told us about the commercial, and we were like, okay. And then we were watching TV a few days later, and we are like, there he is. It's Frank. <laughs> <laughs> there he is, shameless again. <laughs> In his bathrobe, even with his well, hair you know, pulled very one, extremely forward. I have to say, that's one thing I love about Frank is he is enthusiastic about anything music. So you go, hey, you know, what about doing the song? For sure, he gives it a go. I love that, and that's why we collaborate so well too. Because he's never about, oh, well, I don't know. We're trying to figure. It's all like, yeah, let's try it. Sure, let's give it a go. I mean, that's that's pretty amazing. Because then you, amazing. it just there's no. No holds barred. You know, you just kind of go for it. I like that. That's right. I, I, I like it's a great uh, attitude. Yeah, yeah. Minimum of drama and a lot of enthusiasm. I say is the absolutely yeah. Definitely, good way to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, what are we on to now, Erin? Well, you've been stealing the show for a little while. I I mean, yeah, I thought. Oh, I'd you just mean you've speak. been quiet for a I've couple been, of minutes? Exactly. And I've, I've been able to get a word in. Here we go again. <laughs> this is what I have to live with, everybody. <laughs> no, this is what I have to live with. <laughs> So we're back. Any everyone out there who may have just tuned in, who are we in the studio with again? We are in the studio with Frank Symes, who is an extraordinary guitar player, composer, and he's the music director for The Who, uh, for Roger Daltrey, for Don Henley, and many, many other people. He is the closest thing that Phil and I have ever encountered to a real musical genius. Uh, and we're also here with the lovely and talented singer-songwriter Lisa Verlo. And together, Frank and Lisa have written a musical called The Door. And we've been talking with them about, well, we've spoken to Frank a little bit about his life, um, and we've talked about the musical The Door, uh, which uh, sounds amazing, and I personally can't wait to get to see live. So, Frank, um, I've got to ask you, because the listeners out there would love to hear this. What was the experience like being the music director for Quadrophenia, which is one of the coolest albums I can say out there? I mean, before we get onto it, I was 21 on the plane to Vegas and I was always into the Beatles, seriously into the Beatles. Um, never listened to much of The Who. It must be because my dad didn't. My brother tapped me and he said, there's a documentary on The Who on, watch it. I remember I watched that documentary. We landed in Vegas. I went to the nearest music store, bought every album they had of The Who. And for the next year of being 21, all I listened to was The Who. Mm. I bought their DVD live at uh, Royal Albert Hall. That was on 24-7. And I fell in love with them. Roger Daltrey became my idol in that year. And I just can't imagine what it would have been like to work on such a masterpiece, Quadrophenia. Yeah, there's a lot of great music. I mean, you know, Hendrix, Beatles, as you said, yeah. Stones, you know, but uh, more than anyone else, it seems that the music of Pete Townsend involves writing a narrative. 
He's the, I paid him that compliment. He didn't respond, but uh, <laughs> I did pay him. I said, you've probably heard this 100,000 times, but, you know, I'm going to tell you anyway. He goes, you beat them all with your narrative, your sense of narrative. And um, what, what a narrative is, is, well, of course, it, there's a story, but there's a backstory. And maybe a backstory behind that. It, it, it's like a portal to a, a world that he's creating in a single song. Yeah. He's able to do that. Not every writer can do that. Uh, people do a lot of uh, word painting, you know, um, nice images or nice passage. But are, is there really a story here? Yeah. And, um, well, in Pete's case, every song is a story. And so it's like watching a film. It, it forces you to use your imagination if you really listen to the song. And so, you know, more than anybody, it was, it was the highest honor. I recognize that in the Who's music, you know, from, from, as you said about... Uh, behind blue eyes to you know everything in quadrophenia or tommy um and um i had done the work for tommy you know putting all the music yeah. together all the proper harmonies and uh um i was known uh, by roger uh as the person who could do that you know no he said no one had done this before uh that means uh that i put together all the proper harmonies that were actually sung and some of them were uh scored by john entwistle and he wasn't around to teach everyone so you'd have to figure this out and some of it uh, you know in Tommy there were up to six parts in uh, of harmony that you'd had to unravel because they were only on one track or possibly two tracks but you'd have to analyze it and figure it out and I was uh, good at that so well that was part of my work uh, with Quadrophenia I had to figure out all the horn parts and keyboard parts and uh, vocal parts and write you it all out. Have to be a musical genius. Exactly. Well, <laughs> a lot of people can do that, but you know the other part of it was, um, well, I'm I was um, I think I was uh, without saying too much. I I think I played a good diplomat in the band yeah. to keep things on an even keel and sort of uh, steer the ship without it rocking uh, you know as little as possible so right you know and uh, just keeping the the show smooth and the band working well we didn't want to sound too tight and lit and knit rather knit but we wanted to be lit <laughs> <laughs> no we wanted to be explosive yeah. i mean that was uh, my talk with pete i said you know and you know no matter how i try i'm much i i'm going to organize this i won't uh make it too tightly knit and I, I want I want to emphasize the explosive power of the Who, and I said well, I'll never lose sight of that. I said I'm all about that, and his single answer was thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I have to say we went and saw the Who uh, for my birthday last year. First of all, at the Staples Center. Yep. And Erin was not a Who fan at mm. first. I wasn't. Well, I I'm a big Stones fan, and I just I never really I never really listened to much of the Who or got into it. Um, until Phil showed me the light and forced me to watch Quadrophenia the entire movie before we went to the show. So at least I was familiar with the songs before we went. And then when we got to the show, I have to say that was the most incredible show I've ever seen. Um, and I was so blown away by the band, um, by Roger's voice, by by the whole atmosphere and the whole performance that I walked out of the, stu of the theater, a huge fan. Um, and then we went and saw them again a few months later when we were back in England, which was just as good. Yeah, and Frank kindly enough uh, invited us to uh, pop backstage and say hello, didn't he? Which was very, very kind and amazing. It was. So, and we still my pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, Phil has the passes. Like we had little sticker passes that got, oh, to, yeah. and Phil yeah. has them stuck on his guitar. He's very proud of them. <laughs> yeah, I am very proud of that. Frank. Thank <laughs> you. You nice. made my year going to that. <laughs> Did you get one of his picks too? Uh -huh. Your son oh, gave yeah. us one last oh, uh, year. Who pick? Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Pick. Oh, one of those white ones. Yeah, with, with the envelope. Yeah. yeah. When we went over to, to Frank and Lisa's house recently and we met their son, Turner, who we were speaking about earlier, if you weren't listening, um, is a little musical prodigy as well. As You must be growing up in that household. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, when we were leaving, he was giving us Frank's business cards. And he gave us a pic <laughs> with Frank's information. He's like, you got one of these? You need one of these. <laughs> uh, those are 22 years old. <laughs> no, no, I'm talking about the business cards. <laughs> 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 My number has changed seven times since then. <laughs> but I have to say it was fantastic, Erin, seeing that and all of a sudden turning her into a Who fan because that meant I could now play the music in the car. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't get complaints about them and had to like, argue away about it. I had to agree when he was talking about how amazing they were. Mm-hmm. That's right. And you put together that amazing show. That's got to be Visually as well. The oh, show yeah. was just stunning. Um, the background, the, the images that right. came on the show. Well, I directed the music that went with the audio. I was the musical director of the audio uh, part portion of the show. Very, very well done. It was amazing. So. Oh, well, and also oh. um, during those shows, Phil and I had our own little bit of synchronicity with Frank because um, very randomly, several years ago, I saw Frank play at someone's Super Bowl party. <laughs> Um, and uh, I met him afterwards, but blah, blah, blah. Um, and then when Phil and I went and saw The Who in January at the Staples Center, I said, hey, I've seen that guy play before. <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. Um, yeah, that. and so that's why I got in contact with Frank. So oh, I thought, yeah. yeah, I might actually be able to get an interview with him, so, having met him once before. You connect, connect. Did with me through somebody well, at that party? Yeah, yeah. Um, wow. So I went. I was at the party, um, and um, someone that I know and I guess knew you as well um, introduced us when we, and I met you, and then moved on. Wow. Um, and then, um, and then, yeah. So I thought, wow, I might be able to get in contact with him and mm. get an interview. And I see. And he did. was playing with the Who then. And when you saw him, I hear he plays a bit of Mean Zeppelin, doesn't he? That's correct. I saw him playing oh, yeah. in a, a Led Zeppelin cover band called the. Is it the Spirit, Spirit of Spirit of Zeppelin? Yeah. Spirit I of Zeppelin. That it's time. not even a cover band. It's just the yeah. We call ourselves a non-tribute. A non-tribute. Non-tribute because we don't dress like them, and it's only a three-piece. But we hardly do it anymore. So. Right. And he's like a cross between Robert Plant and Jimmy Page. I mean, this guy's amazing at Zeppelin. Absolutely. If you can't see Zeppelin, just see Frank. <laughs> <laughs> well, you won't see De- Zeppelin anymore, so, <laughs> so no, come see me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Did you see that they were all together? Um, oh, yeah. For the... Right, for the Kennedy. Yeah. yeah. Never say never. That was no, funny. no, That's what they Roger were all says. together, but, you know. <laughs> Is that what he says? He says never say never. They're not going to. They're, they're not going to play they're. together anymore. No. I doubt it. I'll be very surprised. So we have got a break coming up very soon. We're going to play three songs. And okay. so we're going to have to talk about these songs first. The first song is Sorry. And that was written by the two of you. So that was one of the first songs we collaborated on. That's correct. Which after, I don't remember actually, did we do The Door first or Sorry was first? Well, either way, we were. he was all inspired. We were over at his um, studio back then. It was in Valley Village. And... Um, I guess I had some lyrics, and they were a little bizarre, and I wasn't quite sure what to make with them, but I thought, you know, I, I, there's something in them. I thought, what do, what do you think of this? And so, you know, you show Frank anything, and his just mind just goes 100 different directions, and he got all inspired, and he starts, you know, I, I kind of hear this, and he drags out these things from the kitchen sink and, and the suitcase, and this is the piece that we're talking about, where he just went nuts with percussion and I mean, you played everything on this and matches he played a match and matches well, musically it was based <laughs> on a bass line and the, oh, the melody the baseline, yeah. you know Ooh. music is really i mean you can make music out of a single line but it's really the interest comes in when you have two voices the bass and the melody and that everything else is just sort of filled in right. so to speak i mean that's a probably an oversimplified uh explanation of music but that that essentially is uh what makes music, I think, you know, the, the, you have the bass and then you have a melody, and there are yeah. two different melodies. You often, and um, and they make a, a they they have a synergistic synergistic effect, you know. So that's that's what sorry is about that bass line and the melody. And, so, yeah. and then the next one um, that you're going to play is uh, Weapons of the Game. So that's a, another one that we collaborated on back mm-hmm. in that time frame. That was kind of fun. Yeah. Does that involve pots and pans mm-hmm. as well? No, no it's pots and pans, but that's that involves some more conventional sounding instruments, yeah. but the, um, piano and drums and bass and and some strings. Um, but uh, it's unusual in its structure. It, you don't know where it's going, but it does. It sort of smoothly takes you from one transition to another. And um, I love the lyrics because they're just deliberately nebulous, but in a really <laughs> meaningful way. Thank you. Brilliant! Brilliant! <laughs> So and then Hollywood Friends. Oh, Hollywood Friends. Yeah, Hollywood Friends. Well, that's based on true story as well. And you know, I mean, you just read the title and you know it's satire. And uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's about 
you know, friends I've met along the way who uh, didn't turn out to be so friendly, uh, yeah. or they have an agenda that they don't really care about you, but they just have, uh, they might be able to use you somewhere down the road. And so I, I don't mean to paint a, a picture of Hollywood. I love Hollywood. But we're still processing that entertainment industry. Yeah. You know. I, have to, I have to say, coming from England, I, I mean, might sound like I'm bad mouthing it now, but um, coming from England, I say, there's so many people in this town just out to get you. Right? <laughs> just want to be, like, pretend to be your best friend, and really they've just had the scheming plan all along. Yeah. It's that step up that people want to take. They just want to take it on you, that's all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I don't know. I, th I think there's also just a lot of people, like, practicing trying to improve their own egos in whatever way. Like, they don't necessarily want to use you. They just want to use you to make themselves feel better about themselves. That's true, too. Yeah, yeah it's psychological and business. It's all, it's you know. Trying to suck your energy away. That's why oh, there's so yeah. many vampire films too. at the moment. <laughs> oh, right. yeah. It's actually Definitely. all about Hollywood. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, um, you know, uh, I just read a book called uh, City of Courts talking about the, you know, dark side of L.A., the L.A. history. And uh, I also read a book about sociopathy called um, at the confessions of a sociopath, and uh, you know, there's no compassion, but you know, so so socio sociopaths were a smile, and yeah. they're aggressive, and they're friendly, yeah. and they're gonna devour you. <laughs> and uh, you know, there are, I've met those kinds of people who yeah. have say all the right things, and you know, so it's really hard to know their mo, you know, or uh, motive for what they do. But you know, eventually you find out. Yeah. Eventually they slip and you go, aha, <laughs> you don't really like me. <laughs> You're just using me as a rung on a ladder. <laughs> you know? And so that's, you know, so that song is dedicated to all those friends. Well, so, there you have it. We have three very interesting <laughs> sounding songs. songs coming up. Um, so, go ahead. So first of all, we're going to start with Sorry. Then it's going to be Weapons of the Game. Followed by Hollywood Friends. And Sorry is the song where you're going to hear some of the most unusual instruments ever played. If you didn't know, you can always just buy a box of matches and you can write songs just like that. <laughs> Here you go, everyone. This is Sorry by Lisa Verlo and Frank Sykes. Enjoy. Oh, yeah. 
Hollywood Friends by Top Cat and written by Frank Symes. And we're in the studio today with Frank Symes and Lisa Verlo. Uh, so if you guys haven't been listening so far, Frank is an incredible guitar player, keyboard player, any kind of instrument, um, music composer and musical director for The Who. And Lisa is a wonderful singer-songwriter. Um, so Lisa, how did your musical journey sort of start? Well, the musical um, one, I... I grew up in a musical household for sure. <clears throat> My mom played the piano. I guess she played the cello before I was aware of it, but um, and later guitar. She would she'd be the type that would take um, be with a guitar group and play at orphanages, and she was really into the you know aspect of sharing music and sing alongs. She loved sing alongs and um, musicals, so we were exposed to a lot of music um, growing up. And um, I'd always heard songs in my head. I'd written songs. Um, but I kind of took the route of being an actress, and on the side, I would um, sing in coffee houses. And I wasn't always so great at accompanying my, myself, so I would uh, sing a cappella. And one day, a director came in and approached me and said, Hey, that was, I, I was doing a Gershwin piece. And he's like, Can you do that song in my film? You'd be great. I was like, Well, if you get the rights to it, sure. And he's like, Well, uh, can you write a song just like it? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, why not? So I took that on as a challenge, and um, I wrote one. And then, of course, I had to produce it, and, in order, and they wanted me to sing it in the film. So I had um, I'd been dating a lot of music types back then, too, because very inspiring, you know, to hang out with singer-songwriter, guitarists, and all that. So uh, I had friends who knew friends, and so I got a bunch of really great musicians together in a studio, and recorded this song, or a song, and uh, was hooked. I mean, when you get in there and have amazing musicians play your music, it, you know, there's nothing better, because that's just the synergy, and it just comes alive, and you sit back and go, wow, let's do this, let's do this again. <laughs> so I, I had this perform the song in the film, and then I just I wanted to record, write and record more more music. And, and the next, actually, film I was in, the director heard my at the time was just like a little cassette tape of songs <laughs> it was dating me cassette tapes and um um he put three of the songs in his film oh wow so i yeah i started just going full on with the music and um performing out a little 
And um, I still was into the poetry scene, so I was kind of doing poetry, spoken word, a little music, kind of mixing it up. And um, I suppose, uh, yeah, then uh, I decided if I was just going to kind of struggling, getting by in L.A., because, you know, it's awful hard to make a living as a musician in right. L.A., right. and I was really into playing out in coffee houses, I thought, why not just take the show on the road? So I did that. I, I um, went cross-country touring and uh and what did you tour in well i had a chevy blazer back then not even a van because later on i got a van i can't west folly a camper van that was great but i took off and what's really fun is it really is a cool network out there because you start playing one place and they put you in touch with the next and you say oh i'm going to be headed to louisville and and everyone's giving you advice of like where to go and who to see and what venues to play and there'd be festivals so i played in taos new mexico and I ended up all the way out in North Carolina, the Asheville um, Festival. So, yeah, it was great fun. So I think I remember you saying that you just put your stuff in storage and you hit the road. I did. I did. And it was so freeing to have everything in storage, (laughs) leave everything behind and just get on the road. And um, and back then I had just cassette tapes. I mean, because that was a while ago. (laughs) And, um, and, And you know what was really wild is... People actually across the country, not so much in L.A., but they buy your merchandise. Really? So you can actually finance the little bits of the trip on, you know, with, yeah, merchandise. So I started making T-shirts and doing chapbooks and everything because they would sell. I remember going to a little place outside of um, Cleveland, Ohio. I think it was Sandusky. And um, performed for, I don't know, a group of 30, and they were just into it. They just, I sold out of merchandise. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Very supportive crowds. Um, How long did you do that for? I did that, you know, I did that off and on. Oh, for a few years, like three, or three, three years, probably. That's so inspiring. Yeah, it was fearless. really fun. Yeah, yeah, fearless. <laughs> Definitely fearless. Yeah. So, did you live out of your van while you were doing it? Well, or? you know, you, I met people along the way. I, I actually had family in Colorado, so I, I hubbed, hubbed out of Colorado for a long time. So you used your connections to kind of find places yeah, to stay along and the way. Some people in yeah in Detroit, and but 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 people would put you up when they found out you were kind of a you know. So you stayed with so basically I, strangers. I, I did, and it, you know, it wasn't. It didn't feel like strangers, you know, because when you get with people that are really into this kind of thing and this energy of music and the magic of, you know, what it all means. It's it's like a just a network of, you know, yeah. homies. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> just, definitely. You, know you it heard is. it here, a network of homies. homies. <laughs> Directly from yeah. Lisa's mouth. <laughs> well, you know, and, and then I was also really into the poetry scene mm. back then too. And the poetry scene, you know, with beatnik types, they're just um it's great fun. I mean, you must have I've so met, many stories from that time in your life. I do. I've met some really incredible people and and been offered to, you know, do some. Actually, I was offered to go um, perform at the City Lights bookstore opening in, in Italy, but I, I didn't make that one. So I kind of regret it now. Oh, yeah. But, um, yeah, because, you know, yeah. one thing leads to another. And so, um, but I, and I ended up back in L.A., um, to to record uh, my CD called Home, and um, perform, and then I sort of hooked up with a manager who was kind of grooming me and loved the songwriting. So I, I stayed there instead of keep touring, um, to to write more songs. And um, I kind of wonder, like, oh, what would happen if I kept on the touring route? Because that's kind of fun too. But um, this way, I ended up doing a lot more writing and recording, and that's when I met Frank because I was working on a song. Um, High Inside, and uh, well, I had done the whole CD uh, called Home, and that was like a CD of spoken word and music. Very cool. And um, and then just wanted to keep right. Well, you know how it is. You get in the studio, and it's just magic. So I was I was ready for my next CD, and um, had this song High Inside, and a girlfriend. Oh, I was yeah ne- needing a guitarist, and a girlfriend said, Hey, you know what about Frank? She, and uh, so I approached Frank, and he was all enthusiastic, as he always is. And, of course, ended up producing. <laughs> it just kind of <laughs> took over because, you know, he brought in the drummer and just made it sound great. I think he wanted to even redo it now that, you know, <laughs> he hears something, and he always has ideas. He's like, let's do this. So you guys met making the song. So we met making the song, yeah. And um, That's very nice. 
That's yeah. a very good story. And everybody out there, we're going to play High Inside right now. But first, oh, uh, first, what's it? Oh. What's it about? It's about. Uh, you know, I think it's, the song will speak for itself. Okay. Well, this is Lisa Verlo of High Inside. was High Inside by Lisa Verlo, and we're in the studio today with Lisa Verlo and Frank Symes. So Lisa, um, before the break, was telling us about how for a couple of years she kind of just put all her stuff in storage and traveled all over America um, and did gigs in coffee houses and bars and everywhere. Um, what was that like? Well, that's when you realize how much stuff you don't really need. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it all comes to haunt you when you have to open the storage <laughs> base back up and then you end up maybe with a couple different storage places because I had one in Colorado and and then you get it all together and you have double of this and double of that. <laughs> well that's later but 
but that feeling of just because uh, then at one point I I got a Westphalia camper van which had you know a sink and a little closet and and that was the best because that's just like self supporting and and actually in that van I did one of the first internet um, sort of jaunts with um, an artist called Craig Millman he. Right. Um, yeah, he he. We we decided to get together, and he was gonna paint and do some artwork, and I was gonna sing and perform, and we were gonna hop on because back then was when the internet was just getting started, and we were gonna hop on different coffee houses and hook up to the internet and upload what we did for the day, and we called it Avoid Nevada, and that's still out there. I think avoidnevada dot com or something is still out there as a trip that we took, <laughs> and there's pictures, there's there's videos, there's sound bites. From this um, kind of one of the kind of things I did, I also did another thing with some other poets um, called Gas Grub and Grammar Tour, which was <laughs> the poetry and kind of a thing that I did with um, Hank Haina and, and Victoria um, Torres. And um, yeah, that was uh, a lot of fun too. So, Juliet Torres, I'm sorry. So here in our studio today, we have real life, wandering, free spirit, musician, singer songwriter Lisa Verlo. That's right, yeah. <laughs> She's published now, too. Wow. Well, yeah, you know, I had Anthology. a few things. Right. Well, I was um, mentioned in the, was it um, News Trips and Ego News? <laughs> I should know it. Ego Trips, yeah. Um, something like News Clips and Ego Trips. Yeah, it was a book about the poetry in the 90s and the as touring poet, I kind of was mentioned in that, and that's really cool. Because awesome. I kind of came back to LA and was like, "You guys, you should all go out there. This is great." Because <laughs> here in LA, it's all pay to play, and you have to like try to talk over the crowd, and all the cappuccino machines are going off, and and you tour the country, and they all come out, and they want to hear what you have to say. It's amazing. Get your chat books, you know, together and sell them. And so, yeah, some poets um took that advice and went out and kind of, you know. And that was right about when the slams were starting, too, because I ended up in a few slams when I was across, going across country. I ended up being a judge in a slam in, in North Carolina, was it? Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Wow. Uh, wow. That's all, that's all I can say. <laughs> Lots of stories. Yeah. Um, so at the break, you were telling me, um, I asked you what your favorite place was that you played in. Um, oh, yeah. And you, told, you were telling me something really nice, um, and it kind of brought to mind... Um, what the real experience of music and music sharing is. Um, and it's not, you know, about celebrities or necessarily giant rock bands, although those are great too, but, you know, it's about being accepting of new musicians, being open to hearing new stuff. And can you tell me what, tell everyone what you were telling me at the break about um, that place in Ohio? Oh, yeah, just about, well, I think I'd mentioned that, you'd know, you'd show up and everyone was really eager. The room would be quiet. They would be attentive and completely you know, wanting to hear what you have to offer, which I was just a little different from the LA experience of having to, you know, just get on a list of trying to play somewhere and and then just one after another. It was more of like the showcase thing. And cross country you go and you're the you're it. You're the feature and they're all, you know, interested. So and it was just and, and very supportive too, because it was a real network. I mean people would would be inspired and say, hey, you know, you'd be perfect for this place. Why don't you check out this venue and that venue? And and by the way, this festival is going on, and you'd approach the festival, and they'd be like, oh, yeah, sure, come on board. We'd love to. <laughs> it was great. I mean, I thought it was, I don't know if it's still like that. I would imagine it. it is, though, because how many people really take off and <laughs> drive across country? No. I do have to say, though, in L.A., it is crazy the fact that, like, to play, you sometimes have to pay That's yourself right. to play pay the house yeah, yeah which is, it's really crazy to me we've uh, got a friend um his name's jp jones uh, his music he goes by the name of son of jack and he did an album with chrissy hines and they did pretty well from it and he'd come over here to do some shows and la no one cares about him right it's like whatever they put him on at the hotel cafe in the end but still they're like he needs to hit this number of people that are and then two days later, he went into the show in Big Bear, of all places, <laughs> and he was like the celebrity of yeah. the town. Everyone <laughs> exactly. came out to see him. Everyone had a great night. Like that's I think how the whole it town of Big Bear be. showed up to see him. Yeah. But like in LA, it's just, that's like lost. Mm -hmm. And like you say in traveling the country and stuff, and everybody flies here around the world to try and be the big star, where in theory, 
skip LA <laughs> and right. tour the rest of the world. Go to Colorado. Yeah. They pay for bands to. Pl- I mean, they pay the band. They don't make the ba- band pay I, to play there. I know. I I used to play in England, and I'd get like uh, they'd give me and my guitarist a uh, hundred pound for an hour each. It was great. Mm-hmm. And come yeah. here, and it's like, no, you give us the money. <laughs> That's right. I beg your pardon. <laughs> So uh, everyone out there, take a leaf out of Lisa's book and uh, get touring. Get a camper van, put your stuff in storage, and just go do it. Get out there. Only live once. And sell your merchandise. You know, exactly. (laughs) Merchandise, and now you can merchandise about anything. You know, get those mugs out there. (laughs) Um, Well, we were speaking to Lisa the other day, and um, you recently took up a new instrument, right? I did. I had always wanted to play. First, I always wanted to play the violin. Because I just thought it's you know beautiful, and my grandma actually my, on my mom's side was from a, a family of concert violinists. So I thought, mom, you know, I should play the. I I started on piano. My mom was you know very adamant that we all start on piano. So I learned to read and write music. And I was like, well, mom, I really want to play violin. And she was like, well, your grandma gave the violin to Debbie, so she plays violin. So you got to <laughs> practice your piano, and if you play enough piano to where I you know, it's like. But then she meanwhile she had played cello, but we didn't have a cello in the house. So I grew up wishing I could play violin and cello. And then I had my dad going, well, you know, if, you, if you're if you not a, an amazing prodigy violinist, why bother? <laughs> so I, the and worst thing you I was told, <laughs> I was always, you know, it, whenever I'd bring up the violin, I said, well, you know, it's a very difficult instrument. It's very hard to play. So I kind of gave up. And the other day, um, Frank's daughter played stand-up bass so he's got a stand-up bass in the studio and we needed a stand for it because it was leaning against a wall and (laughs) it wasn't such a good idea um so I went to a a shop and they had violins and cellos and I bought the stand-up bass stand and and I asked him like so how much is it to rent a cello thirty dollars I'm like thirty dollars a month I want to play cello I'll I'll, (laughs) I'll take one Uh so I took one and had a month of um, music lessons and I was already invited to sort of jam with this guitar kind of group you know it's a little pickup parents of kids who are taking lessons kind of thing but it was awesome so I actually played out in public after a month of lessons and now I play cello that's awesome and I love it it's so inspiring I'd say to anyone out there if there's an instrument you've always wished you could play just play it yeah get it however you can rent it borrow it play it because it's so I mean music is is so amazing (laughs) <laughs> feeds the soul. This is very true. Very true. <laughs> and, and now I just go, man, why didn't I stick a cello in my van back then? <laughs> it's kind of portable. It takes a little room, but and how did you deal with the um if you're not gonna be if you're not gonna be a prodigy, then don't play the instrument. How'd you deal with that voice you know, in your head? I just kinda told it I I always knew somewhere inside me that I had a thing for that instrument. And so I actually really surprised my teacher because I I could play. I could I could get a tone out of it right away, so I think it's in the genes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it. I mean, I'm not kidding myself. It takes a lot of practice, and you know, I'm not to a, any level where I'd play out in public by myself yet. <laughs> yep. But I can do some bass lines, and it's fun. And Frank she gets a good tone. I mean, she got a tone, and within two or three days, she had a tone with a bow. Yeah. Very hard to wow. do. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, and he uh, taught me some, some counter melodies, To I've already played Beethoven with him, so that's fun. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It is. There it's you have up. it. Everybody out there, whatever you want to play, just go just, out and do it. Just do, do it. it. Absolutely. You only live once. Yeah, you and might jam. not be very good for at first, but just keep playing it and you'll get better. And that's if, right. If you never end up being any good at it, as long as it's making you happy, just do it. Absolutely. 100%. So, Lisa, we've got another song coming up of yours called The Race. The Tell Race us about it. is a song I wrote a while back when I was starting to really get excited about recording. I'd done some recording, and um, I forget who put me in touch with him, but I was put in touch with this amazing producer named Lee Carreri, and people know him from Fame. He was the original cast member of Fame. He played the Italian keyboard player. He's a sweetheart, and he's amazing. So I was lucky enough to be put in touch with him, and he produced this song called The Race, which has just a deep place in my heart, and um, I think it's got a nice message. And um, I've got some kids in there, too, to sing on the track, and um, it's a lot of fun. So it's one of my early pieces, and, and Lee just really brought it to life. And, and so, and that was, I mean, I was really lucky to play and record with some amazing, talented people. 
and um, there's, there's nothing like that too. That's that's real magic when you have someone like like that. And so that's that's the race. That's awesome. And, and I love the lyrics. The lyrics are beautiful. Thank you. That's fantastic. So just before we go to the song, everybody out there who's just tuned in, we have had the Zen Master from Heartbeat of a Planet arrive at the studio. You never know when he's going to arrive, do you, Erin? You never know. That's Hanny Nasser. He will be playing a little bit of Oud later. But right now we have got Lisa Verlo and Frank Symes in the studio with us, and we're just about to play The Race. By Lisa Bell. And I want to mention one more thing is Lee Carreri does a, some interesting things too. And one of the ideas he came up with is playing water. So you'll hear in the opening, um, he's actually playing water, or actually the percussionist um, sort of added some a bucket of water, and that's in the mix. Here's mm. the race by Lisa Bell. to 
Race by Lisa Verlo, and we've been here in the studio today with Lisa Verlo and with Frank Symes, um, and you guys have been such a pleasure to have in here. I got to say, thank you, thank you. I it have to say, the stories both of you have are absolutely incredible. And uh, just during that break, I was saying that we're going to have to bring them both in individually because <laughs> you, you both could do a two-hour show like that, <laughs> honestly. And it's so like. Learn so much, and like we were saying just before the break, everyone out there that's a musician and stuff in LA, get yourself out and start touring. <laughs> it's the only way you're going to make fans because the majority of people that are at the gigs in LA aren't really going to remember you. <laughs> so get out on the road. Well, even not just not just even as a career thing, just to really experience music and to be able to share it and have people receive it well. Maybe just go out and tour and, and meet and play for as many people as you can. That's right. If I hadn't have left England and just packed my bags and come here, I'd have never met you. That's true. And then we'd have never done this project and we'd have never met Frank these people. and Lisa. We wouldn't right. be here. It's the butterfly effect always up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, our time is drawing to a close. Um, as a very special Christmas treat for you all out there, um, Heartbeat of a Planet's own Zen master, Hani Nasser, has come in and he's going to play a song on his oud for us. Um, and uh, before we go, uh, Lisa and Frank, can you remind us where everyone can find you guys? We're pretty well um, out there on the internet. You're talking about... <laughs> Yeah, I'm talking about website. online. Yeah. We're not talking yeah. about your house. <laughs> Find us like on the sidewalk <laughs> tomorrow. No. Uh, FrankSimes.com and LisaVerlo.com, although that's pretty outdated. But um, <laughs> we got to get up, you know, we uh, keep up the websites. And that's check a out, full-time job. Yeah, and check out their musical, The Door, a musical.com. Yes. Um, and uh, and if you ever forget where to find them and you want to know, just contact us on our contact page at www.heartbeatofaplanet.com. And you can find them both featured on our website under the musicians page. That was pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, yeah oh, Thank our you, pleasure. Phil. No <laughs> problem at all, Frank. <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you both. It's been fantastic. It's been great. It, fun. It's been wonderful. So um, we're going to finish off with a song with Hanny. It's a little bit of a treat coming to play. Um, and then we're going to come back in and play Frank and Lisa's This Holiday 2. And that is going to be the Christmas special. Everybody will be back in the new year. And we can't wait. We can't wait. More friends are coming in. More private concerts. And everyone's going to have a great time. So Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And here's Hanny Nasser. He likes to take his time as everyone has listened to this radio show knows. We are in Hanny's time. This is why he is the Zen master. Good evening there.
Phil. Good evening, honey. How are you doing today? Phil. Joe. Frank. <laughs> Lisa. Mm-hmm. Hi. Nice meeting you guys. Nice meeting you too. Nice meeting you too. I can't wait for this, honey. Do we need headphones? Or? It's up to you if you want headphones or not. No? No, I don't need headphones. Perfect. Uh, let's see. We are five days. There we have it. That's Hani Nasir. Thank you ever so much, Hani. That was beautiful. And everybody out there, um, other than just the oud that Hani plays, he was also, uh, you should check him out as a percussionist because, what was it, in the LA Times, he was, uh, they, they referred to him as the wizard. Thank you. Oh, Erin's back. The LA Times referred to him as a veritable wizard on the hand drums. And watching him live, what were they drinking? <laughs> <laughs> I think the same thing as you are right now. <laughs> so anyway, everybody, thank you ever so much for listening today. Uh, this is Heartbeat of a Planet. We've been so lucky because we've had in the studio, Erin. We've had Frank Symes and Lisa Verlo and, of course, the Zen master, Hanny Nasser. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy, happy holidays. holidays. Happy New Year. Happy you Hanukkah. A, that's the one. Have a great time. <laughs> we'll be back next year.
We absolutely love everyone that's listened. Make sure you check back in next year, every Thursday, 5 to 7 p.m. Heartbeat of a Planet with Aaron and Phil. Thanks. Here's a song we're going to leave you with called This Holiday 2 by Lisa Verlo and Frank Sines. Stay tuned. Merry Christmas, everybody. We love all of you. All right, bye. Bye. May peace resound Let there be love To everybody in the world A happy holiday May hearts rejoice In every voice The joyful ring Of happiness this holiday For every child Give a smile Don't be shy Make it bright Show you care Let us share This holiday May every wish Fulfill the dream Everlasting peace this holiday For every child, every child Give a smile, give a smile Don't be shy, be shy Make it bright Show you care Let us share this holiday Excite Radio, and you've been listening to Heartbeat of a Planet. We're so grateful that all of you stay tuned and listen throughout the show. We'll be back this time next week. That's 5 o'clock Thursday to 7 o'clock. You have a great weekend. Peace and love, y'all. We are going.